Barry Meadows from Sydney Morning Herald, and welcome to part two of tonight's entertainment, which is a special Q and A. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and pay respects to elders past and present. And I'd also I would like to introduce you to two uh, super talented filmmakers, uh, Jeremy Sims, the great director, and Mark Caden, master actor. Evening all. So Jeremy, I know that you've made last train to free our last cat to Darwin, so this is last ram to Mount Parker. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll go with that, yeah, yep. Uh, the, I did used to get that question a lot, what the next one was going to be, but unfortunately it was just rams. Uh, so tell us how you came to the, uh, do this film, which is a remake of a, or a reinterpretation of an Australian film. Um, yeah, I don't know, have, has anyone here seen the original film, Hutar? There you are. Um, the, it, the original film is a beautiful film. Uh, it's, um, it's kind of, it's smaller and slower and, and simpler in scope than this one. Uh, and it's very, it's much more of an art house film, if you like, than ours is. It's, it's, at a, it's aimed at a much more kind of niche audience and it's beautiful and we I admired it. It was on the same circuit as Last Cab to Darwin was and, and our films were often mentioned in the same breath by people as you know two of the films that people loved at the festival. Um, and then I didn't think much more about it for a couple of years. Uh, but in that time Aidan and Janelle, our two producers, um, had been at festivals the same festivals we were at. And they'd had a couple of schnapps with uh, Grimo, the filmmaker, and they they sort of hatched a plan together um, to remake it in Australia. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about if you did why and where and how and things. And by the time it got to me, they had commissioned Jules Duncan to write a version of the draft. Michael had been approached to be in it, um, and they said, "Jeremy, would you be interested?" So the first question was well, we need to shoot it in Australia, so we would, I'm presuming we change the ice for, for fire, you know, for the heat of, of the Australian summer, which everyone agreed on. And, and then they, I said, well, listen, if I do it, I, I, and I'm trying to think of a way that I can broaden that story out and, and play what is essentially a saga. You know, the original film was based on an Icelandic saga, so it was already a retelling of a retelling of a story that had been told for a thousand years, which is the two brothers that haven't spoken for 40 years. And nearly every culture has a version of that story in its mythology. Um, and, and I thought back about the original film, and I thought the one thing I'd, I wanted to know more about, and I didn't ever get told it in the original, was all the locals that we met that were friends of two brothers who you could see were being impacted by the decisions that they were making and by the lives they were leading, but you didn't get to see the repercussions or, or the cost to the rest of the community of what the brothers' um, feud had, uh, had, you know, what the repercussions of that were. Um, so I said, look, let, if we do that, let's build the world and let's get to know some of the locals and let's see a slightly broader palette. Um, and that's how all of those characters that you just watched in the film turned up. Um, then I populated it with friends of mine, uh, who were all wonderful actors. And we focused more on the community than the original film did. The, the impact of a pandemic on a, on a group of people. And I mean, who knew when we made it that it would work as a metaphor for Australia in, in these um, COVID times. But, you know, people sitting around at a table saying, you know, should we trust the government or not, is what everybody's doing in Australia at the moment. So. It turns out to have been a good decision to, to make it the way we did. And, and we wanted to, to play to a broader audience. As you can see, it's a PG-rated film, so at the screenings we did at my local cinema, we had you know, five or six groups of whole families um, turning up and watching it with their teenage kids. So that's what we were hoping for when we made it, which is, which is where we diverged from the original, and which is why I think it was, it was worth doing. Right. Michael, was this an easy film for you to say yes to? Did you instantly respond to the material? Um, look, I had a look at the uh, uh, at the Icelandic version and gulped a bit at it because it was monumental. And initially, they approached me 
uh, to play Cole. And, uh, and uh, what happened was, with the rewriting of the script, that uh, Cole then had a love interest. <laughs> and they just didn't go for me for that sort of thing. <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way, but we'll let Rob tell the story. But he's a man. He's a woman, a ladies' man, you've got to admit it. But in actual fact, it was, it was really good. To, it was a real change of pace from the, the character that I usually play. And um, uh, just sort of letting it all hang out uh, with Liz. And um, so I, I think it was, uh, it, it worked for me a lot better than if I would have stayed with the original role, actually. Um, because it is, uh, Sam was absolutely exhausted by the end of that. He had whole days where there was just him. And, and, and she. He, and he's working, and she, and she. And so uh, uh, he was exhausted by the end of it, and, uh, and even with, with the smaller role I had, I was I was feeling the strain of that by the end of it because we we started in in uh, in winter and then finished it in summer. We finished just before Christmas, and we had a, a, a whole period off in between where we went home, and then that beautiful verdant green. Of, uh, of of winter transformed into this browned out uh, arid uh, summer landscape. It, it's quite dramatic what happens. And then that absolutely what is what happens in the the area around Mount Barker is during winter it looks like southern England. It's just lush and green, and beautiful and cool. Think of the northern rivers yeah. in a good season like yeah. they've had yeah. now. It's and cold, it's a, you know, yeah. and, and windy and cold this, from the Southern Ocean, and then come summer, it just absolutely, utterly. We we went away for six weeks, and I I said, well, there's no way when I come back, this green world is going to be suddenly brown, and it was. It was sure right. Never was. landed in the plane and went, oh my god, it happened. Is it a place that's also susceptible to bushfires? Yeah, well, they yeah. had just had a really major bushfire that year um, in the Stirling Ranges, which had been all over the news. Um, and in fact, the news footage that you see in the movie uh, when Les is in the hospital is real footage from the Sterling Rangers from that very year. Um, so, and, and they're incredibly conscious of it and aware of it, and all the people in the town, or the vast majority of them, are members of the fire brigade. Uh, and all the trucks you see really are the trucks from Mount Barker, and, and all the other firemen, apart from our heroes, and, um, were, were, were the local fire brigade. So we. That whole film, the, the opening sequence with the sheep, um, all the people to see on the street, the people working in the shops and things, that, that, that was, Mount Barker are, are in the film and uh, they're very proud of it and we loved being there and they loved having us, so it was a, it was, it was a really fantastic experience. Right. So it's how you kind of balanced between the drama and the comedy, it's a real subtle kind of thing, isn't it? And it's different to the original film. Yeah, it, the original, Look, the original film is, is billed as a comedy, but I, I remember someone you know, saying to me afterwards, and said, if that's fucking comedy, Jesus God, I hate to see it. I hate to see a sad Icelandic film. Um, and what I wanted to do was make sure that we kept the pathos where it needed to be. So, as you would have just seen in the, in the second act when Colin has to kill his sheep, um, it's tragic and moving and, and real. Um, but then what we did was make sure that, that there were other moments that allowed us to enjoy the journey um, as much as possible. And certainly Roadshow were very keen for it to be, to have comedic elements. And it was my job to kind of steer them away from broad comedy and try and make it observational and character-based and, and so that we maintained the, um, the integrity of the story. And that was kind of the toughest task in the whole thing, was to, to get the tone right. And I hope we got it close. Yeah, so um, that's interesting that they would push, Roadshow would push for a comedy. I suppose they know how well comedies do, particularly a comedy set in the country. But did you actually consider that? Or did you feel like you had to keep the character stuff in the drama? It, it was well, the real comedy comes out of the deception. I mean, that, that absolute 
you know, while we're laughing, you know, Cole is, let's put it, crudely shitting himself that he's going to be discovered, and that's the comedy. And so you don't have, you don't play it for laughs. It is, it is just that desperation of, of keeping that deception going. Yeah, there was a real push from Roadshow to they wanted to know, which is often the case with producers, you know, can't, can this story handle more comedy than that? And I was pretty adamant that it couldn't go much further than we went um, before we started not to care about the real implications of, of what was going on for people. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty certain I was right because Roadshow have hung on to the film now for a year and they are convinced that Australia is going to come and see it. So that's why we're the first wide release film in Australia since COVID happened. Because they think they might make some money from it. Great. How do you feel about that, given people, obviously not our friends tonight, but there are people who are still a little bit worried about coming back to the cinema, but, you know, it's time. Yeah, definitely. Oh, look, the screenings I've been to, you know, I just I want people to see it in the cinema. Because it's it's fine on a small screen to watch, and it's you know it's beautifully made and well acted, and the music's gorgeous and everything. But that whole world that Steve Arnold, my cinematographer, shot, and and the scale of it, the beautiful anamorphic lenses that we shot the film on, they were all intended to be seen in the cinema. So uh, look, it, it's a double-edged sword for us. There's no competition between now and Christmas, really. Um, there's a bunch of smaller films and kind of and bigger films that no one thinks are very good that have been released. But in terms of Australian cinema, this is the only one that's getting a wide release. And there's no big Hollywood product coming between now and then. So if audiences do respond and like it and want to go and see it with their families and tell their friends, then they can and they can see it in COVID safe cinemas forever. <laughs> so um, I, I, I suspect if the film's worth you know, worth doing well, it will still do well and just take longer. Of course, Last Captain Darwin uh, was a film that ran forever, really, was very successful, wasn't it? Another beautiful performance. What was it like working together again? Oh, it was good, mate. We, uh, we have a real uh, shorthand. Um, and, uh, and Jeremy uh, can push as hard as he likes, and I'll, I'll just keep going with it. I mean, we are past the stage where we have to walk gingerly around each other. <laughs> and and uh, we call a spade a shovel. Yeah. Michael, like any great thoroughbred, he needs to be ridden hard. Any <laughs> <laughs> response? Uh, do I have to uh, talk you into that scene in your underwear? That uh... maybe it was originally going to be in the nude. <laughs> <laughs> you, you I got to that. <laughs> True, it was going to be nude. Uh, uh, we all agreed that maybe we won't spare you guys that. <laughs> Were you on the side of doing you? No. no. He, he, he said no. I'm not doing that. Um, and then I and then I found that uh, great track by Humble Pie, uh, Black Coffee, and I decided that uh, we would work together on on making a kind of different image of him. And I must say that making that little scene with the, with the rum in the fridge and the iced coffee and the music playing out of his old 70s speakers, um, I, I loved shooting it. I loved working with Mike. It was Mike's, you know, it was Mike's performance coming out of there and, and the bottle shaking and that whole world and then singing Black Coffee as he came back past the camera. That, that, that day of shooting, that was, that was the most pleasant on the whole shoot for me because it looked exactly like I imagined in my head, which is always great when it happens. It's a very effective score and also some interesting use of pop tracks in there. Tell us how, about the score and also tell us about why you chose those songs. I, I, I'm a music nut, a very, very eclectic and wide range of music. So I was listening to a lot of Scandi sort of minimalism when this was made and all of my temp music on the film was by uh, composers like Olafur Arnolds, um, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a, there's a whole kind of movement at the moment for that kind of beautiful, gentle music. Anthony Partos did the score, and he listened intently to that soundtrack and then brought his own version of it. To the, it's always tricky with a film nowadays because editing computers are so clever 
you can score your entire film with temp music in a far more detailed way than you ever could before. And I feel sorry for film composers because when the film comes to them, the director has already sat with this music on it for, for months. And it's very hard to get the direct directors to unhear what they put over it and start to hear the composer's interpretation. So I'm always really wary of not saying no immediately to what I hear, but to start to... So I work really closely with him on the... The music's always my favourite part of it. Um, and that track, for instance, the Black Coffee that he listens to, is it's not an album track it's a recording from an english tv show called the old gray whistle test uh live, it's a live recording with um the blackbirds which was an african-american backup group singing along um with humble pie which mm. was you know originally the lead singer of the small faces and it's the most incredible performance live performance of that song and the album tracks actually you nowhere near as good as that um but my, to my producer's great credit, I know this is an arcane story of how we make films, but for instance, they spent three months arguing, negotiating with people in England to try and get the rights, because nobody really knew who owned it. Um, you can get it on YouTube any day of the week, but actually to pay some, to work out who to pay the money to, it's really hard. Um, I'm so glad they stuck at it, because I love it. Michael, what was it like working with, working with these sheep? <laughs> Mate, uh, Jeremy really does a film without sheep. <laughs> it was it was very funny actually because uh, uh, there was a part in the script of uh, Last Cab to Darwin. Oh, yeah, this is a true story. Where the uh, the the cat pushes through this huge mob of sheep, and we didn't have any sheep. We're also we're in the and, middle of nowhere. Yeah, and then this drover came up to us and said to you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was on the day where in the field, in the in the call sheet it said uh, Max or Rex drives through a flock of ten thousand sheep and in brackets if possible. <laughs> <laughs> and we shot all this stuff by some ruins. It's actually on the road between the Broken Hill Adelaide Highway and. Uh, Hawker, which is in the Flinders Ranges, and it's a dirt road, and there's a couple of abandoned homesteads on that road and nothing else. And we finished everything we had to shoot, shoot that it, day. Yeah. And we got, and I was like, oh, well, we'll just have to sort of, I don't know, we'll, we'll make, oh, we'll just go home. And then this, over the, over the hill came a couple of kids on motorbikes, and they said, hey, you guys don't want to film some sheep, do you? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, we, true. we do, actually. How many have you got? And he said, oh, about 10,000. <laughs> and sure enough, a dust cloud sort of rises, and then 10,000 sheep come towards us. And, and we, we, we had about 10 minutes to get the cameras in the car and the people organised and everything. And I started telling everyone what to do, and, and Kate and just said, shut up, Jeremy. And turn the camera on. <laughs> well, he wanted to go too fast with the sheep, which meant most of the sheep would have gone behind us. Uh, and then, um, I suppose that the first time I went went droving was droving sheep when I was about fourteen, and I and I share uh, a lot of the characters' opinion of the merino. <laughs> the merino will fall over and lay there. And then it would, uh, you'd have to get off your horse, put it on its feet, and then it would run off and, and join the rest of the sheep. But if you didn't pick it up and put it on its feet, the crows would pick its eyes out. So the, the hard thing about the sheep in this, however, when we were on the quad bike, was that Jeremy would screw it, get too far away, get closer. Get closer to the sheep. I, I, I've got to get to on the one shot. Get closer to the sheep, and and so of course I did this. But the sheep dog had no look at all for the quad bike. It, it wasn't interested. It, it, it was all on the sheep. So Sam's behind me, and we just had had code. Hit me on the back, shit dog, break. <laughs> You know, and, and on about three or four occasions, I, I nearly ran over the dog. 
we spent three days shooting that sequence, chasing the sheep through Western Australia. And, and uh, for a while, there, when we were in the middle of it down on the beach, we thought, you know what, we need to rename this film Sheep on a Beach. It's, 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 no one's ever seen a film where sheep uh, herded along the beach before. So, um, it, it was, it was, uh, there were a lot of things in this film that had a high degree of difficulty, and that was one of them. The lovely touch, the lovely character touch, that they each had different names for the dog. Yeah, <laughs> I love that too. Uh, tell us how much of the bushfire stuff was real and how much was it done by digital effects? Uh, well, well, uh, there was very little CGI. Well, on the, on the beach, if you see that glow in, on the horizon, well, that is CGI. Uh, we just had wind and smoke machines and things like that. Uh, but the actual bushfire itself was rigid itch, yeah. The sequence where Colin packs up his clothes and fights the fire, gets in his car and, and sort of backs it out, that's all created um, CGI, but the they gave us 40 acres that we were allowed to burn, so all of the montage of them back burning and that wall of fire, that's all real. That big, huge pool of smoke going up, that's all real. Um, there was, we had hope for it all to sort of crown towards us, but uh, the guy doing the backburn had been a little bit, um, what's the phrase nowadays? An abundance of caution. It's a common phrase we hear a lot these days. There was an abundance of caution, and so we didn't quite get the end of it, so we did fill in some parts of that big wine with, with bits of red. But, um, you know, it's sort of 75% real and 25% CGI, I'd huh? say. What's it like uh, acting opposite Sam Neill's model? Oh, a pleasure. A pleasure. Although, you know, it, it, for, for the majority of the film, we don't exchange anything except looks. Do <laughs> <laughs> <Dirty> looks. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it's not until we... Well, well, both of them are taciturn, aren't they? Both characters are, are, are not what you'd call sort of voluble. Uh, you know, they're, they're not verbal at all. No, right O is the extent of a sentence. Please. Yeah, right O, right O. But um, you know, Sam, Sam is by nature quite, you know, a, a gentle and kind of reserved guy. Anyway, so that's why I always thought the role of Colin would suit his personality, and that, that sort of look, we're with him so for so long that you, you need you need someone that holds their cards close to their chest through that kind of stuff and. But also, he has a wonderful understanding of comedy and comic timing, and so there's, it, it's not laugh out loud, loud, loud funny, the stuff that he does, but it's just, it's just amusing, and, and it's fun to watch, and you can watch him do anything. So between that, then, and, and Caitlin's kind of malevolent, uh, unhinged presence, you know, over the, over the fence there, you know, that was what I was shooting for, and I couldn't have got two better people to do it. So tell us about the rest of the cast. You had some some really strong sort of character actors in there, I suppose. Asher Key. Uh, yeah. So a Asher had just finished playing my wife in Swinging Safari. Um, so I gave her a call and said, "Would you like to come over to WA and do do my little film?" And she said, "Oh, I don't know. Probably not. Who's in it?" And I said, uh, "Sam Neill, Michael Caine, and Miranda Rich." And she said, "I'm in." <laughs> not that she's showing, but. Uh, She's, she, she was there in a heartbeat. Um, uh, Wayne Blair's a good mate of mine. Leon Ford is an old friend of mine. We've, we've made indie theatre together for a long time. He played the bureaucrat. Yeah. And it, it, he's, you know, that, that, is, <laughs> but that role is such a, a, such a difficult role for an actor to play. And we, I did audition quite a few people for it and no one got even close. And, and then, you know, and I kind of already wanted Leon to do it, and so I was hoping he would do a great audition. And he just walked in and, and trod that beautiful line of being out of touch, not from there, wanting to make a good impression, but wanting to follow the rules. And, you know, as I say to you before, at the end of it, when he says, you know, I, I've tried really hard, and everyone just, and <laughs> you kind of feel sorry for him. Um, so he was terrific, and, and Sam and Miranda warmed to him immediately. So you know, all the scenes of you know how to clean out your, and the scene with Sam getting him to sign the papers was just 
it was a joy to shoot because he was so prepared and organised and, and trod that fine line where where you want to kind of hate him, but he's kind of fun to watch as he squirms in it. So yeah, that, that was a toughie. The rest of the guys, um, Travis McMahon is an old friend of mine I played footy with who hasn't acted for years, but it's fantastic. Um, uh, so they're all friends of mine, basically, from, from 30 years of acting. And I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I can call on people like that for, for small roles when I make a movie. Miranda Richardson's a great actor, but not necessarily the first person you'd think of for a film set in, you know, country, Western Australia. No, she, she the, our, our international distributors, West End Films, were very keen for us to, to cast an English actress in the role of Cat, and the role was written for an English actress. Um, we kind of made the connection that, because the, the, the ancestor sheep of most of the sheep that are bred around Mount Barker, which is a sheep breeding area, is the Dorset Horn. And so we made our sheep the Calgon Horn, which is completely invented. Um, but the Dorset Horn is, 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 is what we used. So we sent you from Dorset, and then they said, well, can we get Julie Walters or Brenda Blethyn to come and do it? And I said, well, we could. But what about Miranda Richardson? Is that at all possible? Um, and then, you know, long story short, I called her from the pub at Mount Barker, and she read the script, and she's friends with Sam, and she said, I'll be there. And I, I, was, so, I was so nervous directing her, because I grew up watching Blackadder, and she's like my favorite actress in the whole time. Um, oh, she's enjoyed to watch. Yeah. So yeah, we were very, very happy to get her, and, and uh, uh, and we were very lucky to get her. That, like, the pink hair was all, all her idea. And I thought it was maybe too much, it might be too big a choice. And then I walked down the street in Albany about the day after I'd been having this argument, and the three women walked past me with pink hair, and I went, oh, God, she's ripe on the money. <laughs> and I really enjoyed my scenes, most of my scenes with her, because I was unconscious. <laughs> Is that not the first time you've been put in a bath by a beautiful woman? <laughs> See, we didn't see that bit. <laughs> if you've got a question, just put your hand up and we've got a roving mic. Hi, Something must be troubling you, Nick. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, the music that you did, the, the soundtrack, yep. really sticky. You know? Yeah, that's Anthony Partos who every year just about wins something for one of his uh, scores for either television or film. He's a really brilliant composer. Um, everything on it is played by an Australian musician. There's, uh, he plays a lot of the keyboards, but otherwise all of the, it's violins and flutes and banjos. And uh, we, we wanted a really, we wanted a total string sound but we didn't want it to be bluesy or American or Southern in any way. Um, so we kind of went almost Central European in, in the feel for it, and that's his heritage too. Um, so he just did, he worked so hard on that music to, to score that entire film. Um, years ago I made a film called Beneath Hill 60, which was scored by the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, uh, and which was something like Cesare Scubieski wrote that music. And, that was that was one experience, but this one was just as thrilling to, to you know, three in the morning to be at his his studio Sonar Sono Music and there to be it's called a Hardinger violin, which is the main instrument on the in the soundtrack, which is a five stringed violin and it sort of vibrates when you play it a bit like a um, a bit like a Dobro guitar. Uh, and he brought that and a whole bunch of weird instruments to the a zither is in there. Uh, no, it was it was extraordinary. I really, you know, I really hope people enjoyed the music because uh, there's a lot of sweat and tears and love put into it. Okay. Hi guys. Um, mine's more of a compliment more than a question. Um, just like to congratulate how well you've adapted this film. Um, I was really impressed, like you discussed the observational humour, but I feel like that's a lot more Australian. Like we're not one for blatantly like just straight up jokes. It was more. We understood exactly what the humour was here, um, and then also with the bushfires, like uh, there was lots of imagery there which broke the news as it uh, got worse during the January season. Um, like there's that sort of image of the burnout kangaroo, 
and sort of New South Wales South Coast fires, there's that really famous image of the joey on the fence as well. Um, I was just really impressed sort of how that still sings. Like unfortunately we're about to hit fire season again, um, but just how powerful that imagery still comes through and a lot of Australians can relate to that. Um, and then also with the music as well, using Slim Dusty, like it's very, very Central Australia gold. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, and, and a, lot of credit, um, a lot of credit for the world where he needs to go to the production designer, Clayton Jauncey. Yeah. Because um, he, it, I don't know if you, you, you noticed, the house that, that Les lives in is actually the property that we use, which is a massive sheep property in between the Stirling Ranges and the Pronger Ups, and, and those mountains really are on either side, north and west of all the shots there. We, you, know, you couldn't take a shot there without them being in the background. But that house was built in the 1860s by hand, by a family in the days when the only way you could get out there was on a bush track. Um, it was made of local sandstone. And it had fallen apart a lot more than where to rebuild it, but Clay had to rebuild it with safety permits and things. And then he built Colin's house completely from scratch. Um, and it's all just made of, you know, it's completely fake. But it, when we were in it, you would you believe you wanted to live there, and so at the end of it, when I said, "What happens to the house?" and they went, "Oh, we're going to burn it tomorrow," and I went, "Oh, that's so sad." Um, but all the little touches, the seventies. I grew up in WA, so I can tell you that all of the things in Colin's house, so many of them were evocative of my childhood that it was just a pleasure to shoot. Right. Okay. Another question up the back, please. Yes. Look, it follows on from the previous question. I was just. I, the, as you commented, what a beautiful script it was. How long pre prior script do you actually work on the script before you even get before the cameras to actually start shooting it all? And so Jules Duncan wrote the first draft, um, which is what I may I think I read the second draft when it came to me. So he'd already sent one to the producers. They'd given him a few notes, he'd come back and I got a second draft. Um, I'm pretty hands-on in the script department. You know, I, I, I wrote Last Game of the Darwin with Rich Cribb and I've written a couple of other scripts. So I didn't ask to be a co-writer on it, but I did give him an awful lot of notes. And mostly it was about crafting the town, all the characters, and giving them really clear journeys, really clear um, arcs. And as Michael was saying earlier, you know, they, they all have their own little stories that with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and, and a good six months of work on the script, really. Um, Jules came over to Sydney for two weeks and we spent two weeks in a room thrashing stuff out and arguing a lot. Um, and and you, can't, you can't create anything in, in, in terms of story and script and stuff with other people and, unless you're prepared to have a pretty robust dialectic about stuff. You really need to argue your case for things and then if you're wrong, you can find out through, through you know, a really robust discussion and, and that's how I like to work on things. So yeah, about, about six months. Is he, is he a new writer? Sorry? Is he a new writer? I yeah, so he's West Australian. He grew up in the Kimberleys, but he spent a lot of his time, he's a, he's a wacky guy. Um, he used to be a cadet reporter for the Albany television station for about four or five years. So he knew all of these little stories that he wrote for the support cast are all true. Oh, wow, I never knew that. Yeah, yeah, That's so great. so he used to go out to farms where, you know, they had a sheep with two heads, and he'd go, hello, I'm Jules from the reporting from Mount Park, and today we have a sheep with two heads. Tell us, how did it happen? Um, <laughs> and that's what he did for a living for three or four years. So. He understood the and he's from he's from the Kimberley, from a small country town. So again, he understood that dynamic. And as you were asking about the the, the fires before, like you, it's great. You know, you think oh, we'll make a film that's got that's got stuff with the volunteer fire brigade in it. But then when you meet the local people, you see how integral to their life it is, and how important it is, and how it's not it's not a game. It's just this thing that everyone is aware of all of the time. Um, it makes it a lot easier to, to make it feel real. Okay. Do you have any uh, follow-up question or anybody else want to ask something? Uh, I was just interested, what are the hopes for international distribution or the festival circuit? Uh, festival circuit's kind of come and gone in many ways. We, we were never really a Venice-type, Berlin-type film. 
Um, we were very hopeful maybe of going to Sundance and a bit like last cap to Darwin, we were on their very short list and they only take 12 films internationally at Sundance and I think we were number 13. Again, this was last cap to Darwin was the same story. Um, but then COVID happened. Um, uh, so I don't know if you, just recently it was announced that it's, so we've sold kind of every territory now. We've just sold, did a great deal um, with Samuel, uh, Metro Golden Mayor for North America. Uh, we sold UK, we sold all of Europe. Um, but because it's a COVID time, they're all COVID deals, which means they're all kind of dependent on them being able to sell the product. Uh, it may not mean theatrical, but um, it's going to get seen. It's going to get a life overseas, which is what I want. Yeah, with, with stuff kicking in in, in uh, Europe, the theatre release is, is looking doubtful, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, a, a, a film with Miranda Richardson, and Sam Neill and Michael Caton, um, that plays broad, uh, if it does well at the box office here, then I think it'll definitely get seen in the same way that you can see Last Cap to Darwin anywhere in the world. Now. It hasn't made a fortune overseas, but it has a presence. Hopefully this will have the same kind of level of presence. Just a final question for me. Have you had any feedback from Iceland? <laughs> <laughs> I heard a story from Kip Ann Rothbury, who plays Frenchie, um, who's our kind of resident llama uh, farmer, who turned up at the crew and cast screening with a joey in a pouch over his shoulder. <laughs> Seriously, he's as weird, it's pretty weirder than the character that he plays. <laughs> uh, and him and, uh, and Travis McMahon really did hate each other's guts. And so that was good. Um, he's a weird cat. And he said to me, oh, I said, oh yeah, Simsy, I met, I met Grimmer, the filmmaker. I went, really? He went, yeah, I went to Iceland. And uh, I was staying with some people, and they said, oh, you know, what have you been up to? And I said, oh, I just was in this film called Rams. It's a remake of an Icelandic film. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And they said, oh, yeah, the guy that made that film works at the service station down the road. <laughs> so, he's, so he got in the car and drove down the service station, and he said, where? And they said, that's him there. And he was filling up someone's car. So he went over and he said, hi, I'm, I'm Kipan, I was in the Australian adaptation of Rams, are you Grimmer or Grimerson? Uh, and he said, yeah, so I am. And he's, you know, serving petrol in Iceland. Um, Kip went back to his place, they had a drink. Um, he said, have you seen the Australian film? And he said, yes, it's very different. <laughs> uh, uh, I've heard from our producers that he loves it, but um, Kip's version of the story was that they got very, very drunk on Icelandic vodka. And, um, you know, making a film like that, it, it, everyone knows that film, but it took, you know, $360,000 worldwide or whatever. You know, there's no money in making films, unfortunately. So someone as smart and brilliant as him, he's made another film which didn't get as wider kind of acceptance. But it doesn't surprise me that it probably has to be uh, working in a service station in Iceland. But it's a good story. Tough life, man. Probably a cult life working on the yeah. forecourt of a service station. Uh, it's been great hearing from Jeremy and Michael, and we wish them all the best for the film when it comes out. It's a preview, so out yeah, this Thursday, is that right? Yeah, it starts on Thursday. So yeah, if, if you did enjoy the film, please tell as many of your friends to come this weekend. And if you the, didn't like it, Keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, all the, the numbers for this weekend are what really makes a big difference with the film in terms of how long it can play and where it can go. So I tell people to cram the cinemas. Okay, so please say thanks to the, the joining.